Hey folks, you're very welcome back to another episode of the Meditations on Movement podcast. Today we're taking a second look at mobility. This is part two um, of our look at everything that you need to know about mobility. In some way, um, I think you've guessed or at least seen from the first episode, uh, the title itself is in some way ever evolving. Maybe a better way to think of it is everything I know currently about mobility, uh, things that I find useful, um, and things that I find that are obviously very applicable, okay? Um, I've given this idea of the lens that I want you to think of from the first episode, as well as this idea of maybe thinking of, say, the spectrum of possibility, the range of possibilities. Uh, it's never a black and white case with a lot of these things, and a lot of the stuff that you might see online would lead you to believe that a lot of these cases are black and white, but that gray zone is so important to highlight, uh, to really focus on. So take everything that I say with a pinch of salt. It's what I've seen as being very useful for me and very useful for the people that I work with. And for sure, my knowledge is gaining, uh, getting better over time in terms of mobility and my viewpoint of the body and, and everything like that. So um, keep that in mind going forward. I'm sure I'll redo this episode in, in future years and it would be somewhat similar. You know, there'd be principles and, and underlying things there that will be common among the episodes, but there might be a change of mind, a change of heart. Um, and I'll try to be as open as possible when I am somewhat certain, I suppose, with certain things or just at least a little bit more confident. And then where things go into that area of me being a little bit unsure or of yet uh, to kind of collect enough data on a, a certain point, I'll let you know. It also comes back to, to what I was saying previously, that uh, concept from Dr. Andy Galpin that I'm, I'm happy to uh, sort of borrow, which is the concepts are few and the methods are many. So it really comes down to this idea, I was having a conversation with someone earlier today, this idea of it starts to become less important in terms of the actual exercise that you choose. Um, as a practitioner, as someone who is a teacher, a coach to, to people, I, it becomes more important over time to abide by these concepts for sure, rather than thinking of like the individual exercises. And I think what we often get caught in from this outside perspective is looking at things in terms of say the exercises that we do and really the exercises, the movements that we do, they're just somewhat of a tool. They're a means to get to a, a, a concept or a, a state um, something to help us get there. They are not the thing itself. Okay. It's really important to highlight that too. So just to kind of cover what we went over in last week's episode, very, very briefly, just to give you a bit of context. And for sure, if this is your first episode listening in by, I would really encourage you to go back certainly to the previous episode uh, and to cover that as well as this one. And then obviously if this is your first time ever looking at this podcast, if you enjoy this, for sure, go back on some of my previous episodes. You'll see a whole catalog of them there ready to listen to, okay? Um, so I went through very briefly my training and expertise uh, just to give you a little bit of context and something that I'll actually touch on at the very end of today. Uh, I went through what is somewhat of a definition of mobility or the way in which I see it. I went through this definition or this difference, sorry, between mobility and flexibility. Uh, really important to distinguish between the two. It also led us then on to this idea of passive and active modalities, really important to distinguish them, both equally valuable in the context of, of our practice. So we just need to know when uh, it, it, they're, they're useful and why we would apply them. Uh, we also gave you this concept of bioflow and really the important thing here to, to remember is that we are a continuum of biological material, a flow of biological material. It's, it's very, um, important in some way to distinguish sometimes between the different tissues, but we forget it kind of leads us to this uh, fragmented view of the body where we say, okay, this is separate to this, and we forget that they're somewhat the same thing. You know, it's our, it's our language, our use of language with this tendency to separate things that kind of misleads us in some way in terms of our conceptual application uh, of, of some of these things. Um, we then went through this idea of the nervous system's role in mobility. I gave you that idea of confidence near end range of motion and why it's so important. We'll touch on some of that today for sure with, with one of our later points. Um, and, and in some way, like as I said, I like that idea of confidence near, near end range. You could argue that it's more of a protective thing. 
Um, but confidence for me really instills that idea of making sure that we're not looking at ourselves as very fragile. We are strong, we are capable. Uh, we don't want to lead to that sort of viewpoint of thinking that the nervous system's only role really is to, to protect and, and keep us safe. It certainly is a part of its role, uh, but not its only role, okay? Uh, then we finished on this idea of joint focus mobility and movement focus mobility. And I think just touching on that again will really bring us into today's episode very well, uh, leading on to kind of our next few points and, and the, the, the episode at large, okay? So this idea of joint focus mobility, what I, what I mentioned was we could really isolate the body or we could really isolate the joints um, and look at them in terms of their mobility. And while this is certainly useful, I think it leads or touches on this viewpoint of um, the body as uh, managing injuries, sorry, is a, is a way to think of it, where that's one of the lenses in which we view the body. We say, okay, uh, we get an injury, and for sure, it's certainly important to zoom in at that point and say, okay, what is the injured tissue? Where does the injury stem from? What are the rehabilitative protocols that we should go through and we should adhere to in order to get ourselves back up and running? Um, but sometimes we take that viewpoint to our, um, to our detriment. We, we view it at, at, and we view the body as these uh, joints and only as these joints and we isolate way too much because I think personally that a lot of the time in terms of movement, in terms of mobility, just in terms of training in general, as I said, considering we're really good at looking at the body in terms of joints and isolating and zooming in, we forget to zoom out. It goes back to that point that I was saying with biological flow in terms of saying, okay, we, we, we injured our hamstring, we injured our, our hip, our knee, whatever it is, for sure isolate to a certain degree, but don't forget to almost reintegrate to progress on and to view the body or to view that joint when it comes into these more grand movements so while we we, we pinpoint there for that certain period of time remember that we need to to, to gradually expose ourselves to those more um whole movements maybe it is another way to think of it and um, the these more these more grand movements with the body and what it's capable of and reintegrating and coordinating it in a certain way. And um, that is certainly something that I have made the mistake of in previously where I would have only isolated. And I think it's only going through that period of isolation that you start to realize like, oh yeah, this is a bit of a dead end. Uh, there's, there's really as much as I've got out of it and I could really just continue to isolate till the cows come home, but then it won't really bring me forward into the integration towards these whole movements these more grand things that i was talking about and i'm not just necessarily thinking about this in terms of a resistance training setting or a resistance training lens um i want you to think of it in terms of these maybe qualities of the body and um, the the speed the agility all of these different things that have to sort of be brought into the system not just in terms of um recovering from injury but just in general we need to have those qualities available to us where we're able to do things at speed with control, we're able to do them slowly, um, we're, we're, we're able to go through these very uh, grand scale things um, as we progress through our training, so not just from an injury perspective, okay? Um, and then when we look at things in more, more movement-focused mobility, this is where we see this. We might see that if we have too much of a joint-focused mobility lens, we might look at, a, at, a, at one of those more grand movements, those more grand qualities, and we'll say, oh, like that's because of my hip mobility or that's because of my hip strength. And we look at things from a capacity perspective when really what we need to get an idea of is what is the system doing at large? It's not just zooming in, it's zooming out at the same time too. And where that movement focus mobility then comes in is looking at almost the entire chain. What is the entire chain doing? Where are the lines of tension? Not just in terms of the joint, but the whole body. Um, though that same sort of concept in terms of mobility where we're saying, okay, where is the, the limitation at the joint can be applied in some way to the body. And once again, it becomes that spectrum that we're looking at where we say, okay, we could look at it really, really zoomed in towards one end or zoomed in towards the opposite. And usually we should be kind of somewhere in the middle. Um, so, so a really, really important point that I wanted to make sure that we had today going into to the episode to look at these sort of four further points that I want to discuss. Okay. Um, 
one thing that I think sets us up really well for, for, for a good protocol or a good way in which I approach a lot of my, my end range positions is to highlight this point of reciprocal inhibition. And this is really just more of a mechanical, methodical look at, at one of the concepts or one of the ways in which the body um, holds itself near end range or what it does internally. Um, the, the idea with reciprocal inhibition is something that happens when we contract a muscle when we contract a muscle or we contract tissue we have um we have agonists and antagonists okay the body as a, a three-dimensional system will usually have you've got to think about it as something on the opposite side that is doing something and while we might zoom in now and take that joint focused look it'd be very easy to just it's the easier way to look at it we can then remember that we can zoom out and look at it in a movement focus and I'm, i think i'm going to try and highlight that as much as possible when we we, we talk about this point of reciprocal inhibition. So let's say, for example, I take the easiest joint that I have available to me now, or the easiest way of explaining this would be probably to look at my elbow joint. So you can see here, in, if you're watching on video, if you're listening to it on podcast, I'll describe it as much as possible. You can imagine if I have my elbow out to the side, just out straight, um, you can imagine that my bicep is getting a stretch and my tricep is the one contracting. Once again, one specific joint that we're looking at, we can zoom out further and look at the whole body in, an, in another example in just a moment. But what we would find is basically when I contract my tricep as hard as possible to kind of fully extend the elbow, to fully lock it out, I'm contracting the tricep and on the opposite side of the joint, if that would be considered the closing side, this the side that's getting shorter, there's an opposite opening side. Opening meaning it's getting larger. Now, obviously, like when it's fully locked out, it doesn't seem as if one is getting larger, but you can imagine that's the concept. One is closing, one side is closing, excuse me, and then the other side or the opposite side needs to open. And on that opening side, what you're going to find is the tissue that is, you know, uh, uh, involved or that is lengthening on the opening side has to relax so in order for one side to contract and make shorter or to close the joint, the opposite side has to relax. And this is something that actually happens in the body. Now, it is a very simplified version. It would be very hard to say that there's a full relaxation, you know, as, as the opposite side, there's a full contraction. But you can imagine inter if, if the body was to contract on both sides, no movement would really happen. And if it wasn't to allow sort of a relaxation on the opening side, it would be very, very difficult for that closing side, the contracting tissue, it would be very hard for it to, for it to do its job. So this idea of reciprocal inhibition is just to set an idea in our mind as to when we are contracting, the other side is relaxing, okay? And it once again goes back maybe towards that passive and active modalities that we were talking about. So when we're moving into a certain position, as I said, very zoomed in, one joint look at it where we were looking at the elbow, you can now imagine that throughout the whole system as we move through different positions, some area or some tissue uh, is contracting to some degree to, to move us into a certain position and the opposite side needs to relax to a certain degree. And I think this really uh, drives home the point of relaxation is just as important as say like the building of the strength you can see it with a lot of people when they move how there might just be a unnecessary amount of tension in the system is one way to think about it and that could be there for various various reasons but getting this ability to actually relax the tissue learning how to stretch i think i would have point uh, pointed to this certainly in the first uh, episode that's super super important actually learning how to relax tissue at the same time, learning how to control it or become aware of it, okay? So these are all different things that are super, super important when we look at this this sort of, um, when we look at things from a mo mobility perspective, being able to move into these ranges. Um, this leads us on then to this idea of strength at end range. So if I go back to that elbow example, that elbow out straight, in order to fully extend the elbow, I need to be able to contract my tricep have enough strength in that tissue and then have enough of an ability to open up on the opposite side okay and you can imagine that to some degree there also needs to be a little bit of strength on or confidence probably referring back to the nervous system's uh, uh, ability to feel confident near our end range of motion there also has to be a certain level of confidence in the bicep tissue okay if my bicep tissue gets to a certain length then it's going to be getting that afferent feedback it's going to be getting feedback that basically says hey 
don't go any further. You can imagine if I was someone with a very limited amount of mobility around my elbow, if I couldn't fully extend to that kind of 180 degree angle that we would see as sort of typical for most people. I know most hypermobile people are gonna be able to go a little bit past that. But keep this idea of, okay, as I contract my tricep, my bicep tissue or the tissue involved in sort of the opening up of the elbow joint, uh, that has to be confident. It has to be somewhat strong. If the tissue is way too weak or if our nervous system is assessing things and going, hey, we might actually hurt ourselves here, then we are going to likely have a limitation in terms of our range of motion. Okay, multiple different ways that that can that can present itself, but that the the idea of them building our strength at end range through various protocols or various methods, um, that's super super important in the context here. So actually being able to show our nervous system that hey, you don't need to be concerned when we're getting into this range, and that's what you will see over time. If anyone has ever been gone through the process of say having limited mobility around maybe like the hips the knees, the ankles, the, the as I said, this is the joint view, or just general limitations in mobility in terms of being able to open up the entire body. What you're really giving yourself is the strength and confidence um, to go through these different positions and that your nervous system doesn't just freak out almost. It has enough data, it has enough input, it has enough, um, a, enough confidence that you're okay, you're not gonna hurt yourself, and as we go through it, that becomes way, way more prevalent uh, with, with continued movement into those different ranges, okay? Um, you might literally start by just doing isometric contractions near those endpoints. This is where we go between maybe passive and active modalities. A passive modality might be just bringing yourself into a stretch. So you could imagine maybe with a bicep stretch um, where I try to extend out the elbow, I could maybe adjust at the shoulder joint as well to sort of help get a little bit more of a stretch. Um, but basically trying to find where you might feel enough of a stretch position, that would be the passive nature of things, you're trying to breathe, you're trying to relax, you're trying to calm your nervous system down and say, hey, we're all good here. You could then perform an isometric contraction, so you're isometrically contracting what would be the sort of uh, opening tissue, and this would give you a chance to give some data, give some feedback and say, okay, we're, we're learning how to contract things on a very sort of minute basis. Um, and then you would eventually start to progress that stuff into being able to say, move into it, to eccentrically load it. I know I'm getting caught in the weeds here in terms of say the individual methods that we might start to use, but this is where we come from in terms of the logic of understanding a concept of mobility and then being able to apply things from there. So you can start to take certain positions and think, okay, when I get into those positions, Am I able to relax in the position? Am I able to control my breathing? Some of the things that I was pointing from the first episode. Am I then able to say isometrically contract? Can I potentially load it so that I'm doing very, very small loading parameters or protocols, excuse me, where uh, they're certainly relative to me and my ability to, to handle load at that end range position and I'm not certainly in uh, danger. Like I'm not just suddenly loading super, super heavy um, way too soon, way too quick for that tissue and what it's currently able to do. You have to build that awareness first. You have to build some sort of confidence in terms of actually connecting to the tissue. And then you have to progress things more from that, uh, that range of, of capabilities and up towards the more movement focused mobility too. It's not always the case that you would start off with the joint and that you would go towards movement. Sometimes it's the opposite. Sometimes you might actually need to look at things more from a movement focus. You've probably got the joint focus mobility required um, and just the, the the system needs a new input because there's so many different things happening. It's going across multiple joints um, and you just need to really apply it towards the position that you're trying to gain that extra bit of movement or confidence in, okay? So I know I've been going back and forth between points and I'm glad that I did cover a lot of those points in the previous episode because we are really looking at things now going back and saying, okay, those passive active modalities now have a new found uh, we now have a newfound understanding of them because we've looked at things from more the strength, the nervous system perspective, um, and we're starting to apply some of these concepts for sure. Um, another thing, okay, this is another sort of over overarching um, thing that we want to think about in terms of mobility. And to me, this one, this one speaks uh, volumes in the sense that we can really look at things in this minute level and overcomplicate things. But simplistically speaking, 
one of the things that really drives home the uh, concept of mobility, maybe from a more long-term perspective, if you're someone who is moving through a lot of ranges of motion in, a, in these more grand scale things, um, covering as much as possible, you're already sort of doing this in the sense that you're uh, putting stimulus into the area. But if you're maybe someone who is limited in what you're doing, you know, you're maybe um, going through very limited movement patterns, or let's say, for example, you're doing one specific sport where only one or two movements are done at a time, you're going to find yourself not using a lot of the tissue that is, um, or using a lot of the range that you currently have, and you're going to find that diminishes over time. So certainly this is a, a, a simple way to think of things from a mobility perspective is if you don't use it, you lose it. You've probably heard that before within within um, different aspects of training. It applies to a lot of different things. You know, it applies to range. It also applies to strength. You know, this idea of you could increase your strength on a, on a certain movement. You could be perfect for a period of time and then you don't visit it or you don't do anything that really puts that sort of stimulus into the body. You will lose some strength. You will lose some range, you will lose speed, you will lose fitness, you know, uh, aerobic capacity, all of those different things you will lose if you don't give the system something similar or, or in some way that exact stimulus to make sure that it maintains what it currently has. Um, the body is efficient is one way to think of it and it will not just hold on to something for the sake of it, it will continually adapt to what you put into it. So if the stimulus that you put into it is to not be as active as you once were, it's not going to just maintain the, active, the, the, the fitness capacity or the fitness levels, the, the things that you got to, just by doing nothing. You have to either maintain to some degree or you have to continually improve. You have to be trying to, to improve these various different aspects um, if you want to see them not only maintain but obviously get better as well. So it's certainly something to think of when we think of mobility. Are you spending time near your end ranges of motion? Are you going through general patterns or general things that really uh, challenge you that will bring not only the joints but the whole body through these really large uh, movement ranges? And that's really one of the things in a, from a more long-term perspective that is going to allow you to maintain uh, the things that you're currently able to do and obviously gain and be able to do more things in the future, okay? So certainly keep that as an overarching and underlying principle, something really, really important, okay? Um, and this in some way leads to a, a, a kind of a, a point here as well, which is making sure that you're moving into the range that you want, okay? I think this, you know, could be very easily... Uh, we could easily forget this in some way, but what are the ranges that you are trying to improve, okay? I know we said very specifically we started looking at some of the more getting caught in the weeds and looking at some of the more um, uh, specific pieces of advice where we said, you know, isometric attractions, low load things, and then sort of scale things up from there. But for sure, we need to make sure that we are doing more of the things that are rel relevant to the ranges that we want to improve. You know, if I'm looking at, say, for example, my knee range of motion, I, let's say, for example, I want to get better at really sitting down onto the knees. I find that knee flexion is something that really I really, really struggle with. Then I want to make sure that I have lots of things where I'm flexing the knee. Um, not only just from, a, from a, a loading perspective, but just because the more time I spend doing that, obviously loading is really important. I don't want to overload it too much. That's why we'll start off at a certain amount and build up from there. And um, that's certainly one of the more specific things in terms of programming uh, that we want to make sure. We don't just go gung-ho on one thing straight away because we can likely uh, injure the tissue if it's just overloaded. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's certainly something important to consider is making sure that you're actually moving into those ranges that you want. Simple and straightforward with those last two points but I find they're really important to be aware of because um, they will really help us more long-term when we come back to those ones and then we start to apply those more specific methods, okay? Um, cool, last point I want to go on, and this brings me back to what I kind of said at the start of the episode where I was just referring back and saying, okay, um, my, my, my viewpoints change, okay? Okay. Um, 
while I am continuing to learn, I'm at a certain stage right now where I understand these things in, in principle and I feel they're really, really valuable and I feel like I've communicated as much as I can there to um, make sure that what I'm saying I can actually stand by, that I've applied myself, that I've used and they've worked for me um, and as well as some of the uh, more specific methodology behind them as to why they work. You know, all of those things for me give a, give a better understanding and a reason as to why I would go and do these things. Um, there are certain things out there that I have yet to really find out and explore and learn and I'm doing that constantly. I don't think that will ever stop. Um, so for me, this idea of certain systems come about um, it's really one of the things that you find with a lot of these um, models or, or systems is they become rigid. And I've talked about this a handful of times before, but I always want to reiterate this point is we need to make sure that we're aware of this, that a certain system might come about um, a certain um, approach might seem fantastic and it might have lots new of new knowledge to give us, but it needs to be brought in in terms of the general context, you know? while it goes down a certain avenue and it really, really hones in on these certain things, we've got to look at it and say, okay, well, what things are we actually missing out on by only looking at it through this lens or following this path? You know, it's going down a certain road. Is it going down a certain road that isn't actually overall beneficial? It misses out on a lot of things and it only really focuses on this. Those very, very rigid ways of thinking are, are, are certainly um, dangerous in their own right. You get me? Um, and, and, and this is why I wanted to give what is sort of my viewpoint or my expertise. Um, I, I uh, get a lot of my mobility knowledge or, or expertise through, I did a, a, a bachelor's degree in sports science and health. Initially, that is certainly a foundation for me. But in terms of getting the very specific uh, relevant information, I've, I've gone through a system of functional range systems or functional range conditioning, which really looks at things in that more joint focused look. But as I've spent time with the system and as I've applied it, it was a case of kind of going, okay, these these certain things are I'm getting feedback on, but the system is always um, the system is leading me down a certain direction. And I feel once you pull back and see it for what it is in terms of it being only applicable within the one aspect, or ha it has principles that certainly extend out into the other aspect, but you don't just drive home with those things twenty four seven all the time in terms of only looking at the body as a system of mobility that would be a silly way to look at it and i can see how that diving in that look really starts to 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 take hold of a, of a coach's or a teacher's perspective um and i'm glad that i was aware of it at the time and didn't go down too far with it uh to understand that it needs to be brought back and and looked at in terms of a a, a, a grander picture okay so this is a word of warning in some sense i really want you to be aware of that going forward as to how does this apply to my viewpoints of what I'm doing? You know, you might be very, very locked in in a certain, a certain style of training, a certain viewpoint, a certain lens, um, and you might be only seeing the body uh, or, or, or your training or, or whatever it is through that lens. You know, it might be Pilates, it might be yoga, it might be strength and conditioning. Always try to think that as we start to narrow our viewpoint like that as we start to get these models they seriously seriously narrow what's possible while it's great it's necessary there are always going to be things to learn from them that will be um somewhat there sometimes you do just have to let go of those systems to let go of those viewpoints to suddenly realize that like oh i just wasn't seeing this aspect of it and in terms of the the overall expertise and knowledge of of human civilization that's where great things get discovered. Um, when we go to apply things outside of our current understanding in terms of accepting that, hey, we've got, we've got a lot of an, an knowledge right now. We have certainly learned a lot from people in the past and they've given us these systems or these beliefs, these thoughts, but how am I going to use them to explore more things and not just think that, oh yeah, we know everything right now we're, we're perfectly fine where we are and there's going to be no more evolution. Of course there's going to be evolution, but I think when we see these systems, these models, especially within the fitness industry, sometimes they they give us this belief that, no, 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 what we have is exactly fine-tuned, it's perfect, doesn't need to branch out into other things because 
they're usually trying to uh, keep us in the system, to sell us the system, because in a capitalist society, it's very much worth their while to keep you embedded in it uh, and to keep you thinking that other things out there aren't worth your time or your money, okay? Um, so please, please take that on board for sure and have that as the context of what I'm trying to give you here. I'm flawed. I have uh, a viewpoint about the body that is in some way narrow while I'm trying to make it as broad as possible. And I think that will certainly come through in my work um, and what I do it's a viewpoint. It's something to take on board. It's something for you to filter your viewpoint through in some way, to take on board what I've said, to view it, to not necessarily just accept it, but to, to have it and, and to see it in front of you and to go, okay, this is, this is another way of looking at the body. Is it really applicable to me? Um, can there be something gained from it? Make sure you don't just dismiss it straight away considering it doesn't potentially align with your current viewpoints, could your current viewpoints be distorting your viewpoint? All right? So that's everything that I have to give you right now in terms of mobility. So really, really happy with those two episodes, that part one and part two. And um, I think there's a lot, of, a lot of information. And as I said, there are... Um, there's pieces of content material on both my Instagram and my YouTube channel where I go through some of those more specific uh, methods and stuff like that. And I'm sure as, as time goes on, I'll be giving more of that material away and, and talking about it and that you, so that you'll be able to apply it in your practice. Um, other things to update you on, the movement school that I was going to launch at the start of May, I'm actually going to postpone it, okay? Um, I want there to be a lot of buzz and a lot of interest. And right now I'm currently not getting that. So I'm happy to wait to continue to build the material. Um, and, and that'll be the thing with the, a lot of this material, certainly from the start. Um, I want like a, a core group in there initially just to make sure that it is being delivered to a large amount of people so that I can refine it better in time. If it's only a handful of people, then it might not be, uh, it, it'll be, I'll be able to refine it for sure. But I just want to get as many sort of, eyes on it as much as possible certainly it means a lot uh, a lot more um fun for those in the group there's a little bit more of a buzz given that there's more people um and in terms of some of the things that we will eventually do within the school and within the group um, they will be sort of group led or group based activities uh, some of the things going forward too and you're, you're just getting more um more, more of a sounding board in some way to think of it, okay? So what I'll do is I will certainly keep people up to date via the podcast, via my social media, um, but for the moment, it's gonna be postponed maybe for another two months, I don't know. Um, as I said, I'll, I'll keep people posted. I'll, I'll certainly keep mentioning it. I'll, I'll test the waters every now and then, um, and hopefully we'll get that up and, up and launched sometime soon, but I'll continue to build a lot of the material, and I'm, which I'm happy to do. That'll be fun um, on my part. And then when, when the time is right, uh, lightning will strike, okay? So, um, questions. Anything that's come up based on those last two episodes or just general questions for me, um, I'm happy to uh, go back and forth um, via maybe some Instagram Messenger would probably be the best way to contact me. So if you search up on Instagram, uh, my handle is at ronan.lewins. You'll find me there. You can message me there. Go and have a conversation, okay? Um, for the moment, folks, thank you very much for listening in. I, I hope it goes without saying that I've been delighted with the, the uh, feedback that I've been getting on a lot of the podcast episodes. Um, it's interesting to see some of the metrics and see where the interest is. So I'll certainly keep going into those areas and, and, and asking people what they want me to cover. Um, and obviously, if I feel confident in terms of giving a, a very good viewpoint on that co topic, then I will for sure. Okay, but for the moment, thanks very much for listening and I'll talk to you soon.